Physics Bites, a science, science podcast, podcast in English by the students of Notre Dame Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Physics Bites. Uh, we're starting uh, the new season of Physics Bites with the students in our grade 11 class. Uh, they had a project this year about going to the moon and colonizing the moon. And so this is our first episode. We have four students who are going to talk to us about the first part of our adventure, about how to get to the moon. So we have uh, Jeanne, we have Hi. Ivan. Hello. We have we have Esteban and yes. we have uh, Louis. Hello. So all four of these guys worked on uh, the different aspects of the journey to the moon, whether it's going from Earth, what the difficulties are, the economic aspects, uh, and once we're on the moon, how to get around on the moon. So uh, how about we start with you guys giving us a little summary of what you guys presented. Maybe each of you can talk about the part of the presentation that you worked on. And then we can go into the questions that your classmates had for you. Okay, great. So who um, wants to start? Jean, you want to start? Okay, so my part was about um, how to get to the moon in big quantities. And in big quantities means fast, so we can uh, establish a colony on the moon. So um, we outlined maybe three or four ideas, which were um, a rocket sender like that would work like a fidget spinner. Uh, it would spin really fast so the rocket could go to the moon. But uh, it's... And what was the I, name that uh, you said these are called? I think it was something called accelerators or something like that? Yes, exactly. Right, okay. Uh, it's from Russia, but the problem is that the stuff in the rocket would have to bear 50 Gs, and that is unbearable for humans, and uh, fragile supplies and research machines would be damaged. So it's complicated, but if we worked on it, we could maybe uh, find a solution. I suppose it would be something that would be useful for sending stuff that is not so fragile. Exactly. And so, um, what does it look like, these accelerators? It's um, a, a big platform that is uh, spinning really fast, and there are some holes where the rockets can be sent. Um, but yeah, it's quite big. I don't know what are the exact, um, what is the exact length of the platform, but mm -hmm. it's quite big. So it's kind of like a big spinning disc and it turns, exactly. it's like, a, it's like a slingshot. Mm -hmm. So it'll turn the thing. And then at one point when it has enough speed, it'll send it up and hopefully, uh, the velocity of the object is enough to escape the gravitational field and go into orbit where it needs to go. And so what is the main advantage of this besides, uh, the fact that we don't actually have to use, uh, um, blow? it's that it, except, um, for the time you have, when you have to build it, it doesn't use that much fuel, that much electricity. So it could be more eco-friendly than just sending rockets um, with right. tons of fuel. So, which comes to one of the main problems of any kind of travel into outer space is that most of the rockets we use, or basically all the rockets we use, most of their weight is from the fuel. Something like yeah. 90% of the weight of any rocket we, didn't, we send into space is basically the fuel to uh, help it escape from the gravitational field of the Earth. And the idea of these accelerators would be to only send into space what we need because we're not actually burning any fuel to get up there, right? Yes. Okay. But the downside is that they are producing huge forces mm -hmm. which for humans would be unbearable and for fragile research equipment it would be very difficult to survive that yeah okay so what else did you guys uh, talk about which other technologies was it that uh, came up um we talked about uh, a space lift that uh, would go up to 35 kilometers in the atmosphere mm -hmm. um but to go there fast it's unreasonable because if an asteroid hits it, it would be broken and it is really hard to repair a massive lift 
um, in, um, in a short period of time. So maybe to go back and forth, I think Lewis will maybe talk about it. It could be a, bit, a good idea, but to go there in big quantities and fast, it's, um, it's, uh, it's difficult. So when you mean a space lift, like uh, literally like an elevator that doesn't go up to like the 20th floor, but it goes up to 35 kilometers of altitude, is that yeah. it? Uh, how, does that how, how would you build something like that? Where, I mean... I'm thinking about a, an elevator. It has to be sort of uh, anchored somewhere. It's inside a building. I think the top has to be attached to something. How would an elevator work that goes up to 35 kilometers in the atmosphere? Um, it would work with centrifugal force. But I know that Lewis has um, this uh, peculiar project really developed in his part. So okay, I want to... Well... Well, let's go to, to, to Lewis then in this case. Uh, do you want to maybe give us a few details about this uh, uh, crazy idea that's called the space elevator or the space lift? Yes, uh, in fact, uh, the project is not really a space lift. It's more like a space cable. And the idea uh, would be to deploy a satellite, uh, which will gradually release the cable. Uh, so you were saying that the idea of building a space elevator, how does it work? Uh, so in fact, the idea is not really a space lift, but it would be uh, more like a space uh, cable. Uh, ah, okay. The idea is to deploy, deploy a satellite, mm -hmm. uh, which will gradually release a cable towards the Earth and next uh, repeat this action a uh, large amount of time uh, to get a big cable. Okay, so a sort of cable that on the one side is connected to the Earth and on the other side it's sort of staying in space just because of the rotation of uh, the Earth and the end of it that's sort of in orbit around the Earth, is that it? Yes, with a cut away. Right. And how would we use this cable? What would be the use of something like this in terms of uh, space travel or going going to the moon? Uh, we can put uh, some uh, ma ma machine uh, named uh, climbers uh, that uh, can allow us to extract, extract uh, the astronaut or the merchandise uh, from mm -hmm. the Earth's gravity. Right. So the idea again here is that the main problem is getting out of the Earth's gravitational field. And so here, instead of using fuel to go up into the atmosphere, we're going to be using this sort of sort of a cable or, or elevator to get them up there. And then what happens when they get up to 35 kilometers? Uh, next, we can have a launch base and uh, at 36,000 kilometers of high, it's uh, very easy to extract ourselves to Aha! Uh -huh. So I think now we come to, I think, a small uh, error I think that we had before was that it wasn't 36 kilometers, it's 36,000 kilometers, right? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> right, it's okay, Jean. Now, what is so specific about 36,000 kilometers? Why this altitude and not, say, 45 or 100,000 or 3,000? Uh, so this 6,000 kilometer is uh, uh, it's the geo orbit of the Earth. Right, geostationary orbit. Geostationary orbit of and the Earth. Do you guys uh, remember what the geostationary orbit is? What is so special about it? Uh, satellites that are at this high uh, rotate with the same periodicity uh, as the Earth. Of course, exactly. They they are turning at the same, we'll call it angular speed, as on the Earth, which is why the satellite, where the other end of the cable is, would always be above the same point on the Earth. That's how it would work. Otherwise, if it was lower, it would be going faster. If it was higher, it would be going slower. If you want it to be exactly over the same point all the time, well, it has to be exactly at this altitude. That's also where we have our GPS satellites, right? Yes. All right. Uh, and next year, when you guys are in the final year, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, how to calculate 
36,000 kilometers, why that's the height. And it comes back to some of the basic laws of uh, satellite motion. All right, so we've talked about two technologies for getting up to into space. What are some other ones? Uh, maybe Alban or Esteban, did you guys... Uh... Yes, uh, me, I worked on, on Lagrange points. Right. And uh, so what they could uh, bring uh, to us uh, for uh, colonizing space and satellites like the moon. Right, so, so can you uh, maybe very quickly remind us what we mean when we talk about Lagrange points? So uh, the, pr the principle of Lagrange points is to be the, the gravitational center of uh, all the forces that, uh, that are exercised uh, by uh, two celestial uh, objects so it's like a, an area where uh, you could stay stable for for a very long time right so what is the example of the so how many lagrange points are there do you remember uh, normally there are a lot of thousands of lagrange points but between two celestial uh, objects they there are like five Right. Points. So let's be specific about it. Between two celestial objects, where one is sort of turning around the other. So, like for example, between the Moon and the Earth. So there are five Lagrange points. And which one is the simplest one that we worked on last year? Remember in grade ten? No, there is one which is strafed, uh, straight right uh, between uh, the, the two uh, the two uh, celestial objects. Right. But, but I think. Uh, the most simply to use are uh, the L4 and the L5, which are just uh, uh, at the left and at the right of, uh, of right. Earth and Moon. So, so the, the easy one that we talked about last year was there's a specific point between the Earth and the Moon, where basically the Moon pulls with the same gravitational force as the Earth does in the opposite direction, so the two forces cancel out. So if we put something in that point, it's kind of... A point which uh, has no gravitational forces but yes. like you said there are five in total and there's uh, some which are on, on the other side of the moon compared to the earth there's one that's on the other side of the earth compared to the moon and then there's the two which are sort of on the sides now it's very difficult to describe that without an image but uh, so what's so special about L4 and I think L3 and 4 you call them Where do uh, you yes have L4 from? and L5 yes um, uh, but those points are, are stable, are stable, contrary to the other points. So, uh, in a long time, uh, objects like mega structures, uh, like uh, fun to to stay in the space for for multiple people, uh, and as I said, for a long time, or or, fun, or fun, it's more possible. In the future to, to put mega structures in those points so if i understand correctly using these lagrange points the advantage i guess it's sort of like the space lift that uh, louis was talking about in that it's not really a means of going into space but if we build a sort of platform there then we can use it as a sort of a launching pad where yes, it sends like stuff to the earth or the moon and why was that a good thing why would we want to do that because uh, those those uh, points are not just uh, um, easy to, to use uh, to, to colonize the uh, moon, but also to colonize all the space. And uh, the, the mega structures could be a relay for, for rockets like uh, Jan uh, has presented. Okay. And, uh, so the idea again is that we, by building something in outer space at these Lagrange points for example we don't have to worry about every single time getting out of the Earth's gravitational field which is the main reason we have to use so much fuel which is the main reason we don't have a lot of space for actual people or stuff that we want to take up there is that that's kind of the idea right yes okay uh, we already have a few satellites at the Lagrange points which is the satellite yes. that's most famously at the Lagrange point already that we talked uh, about in the past year there is like the, the gems web the right. James Webb one. The James Webb Space Telescope that launched last yes. year. It's actually positioned there. So, again, the idea being that the satellite sort of can move along in the orbit of the Earth without having to spend any energy that comes from fuel. Right. So it's a kind of stable mm. point in space. Um, anything more to add on this uh, uh, Lagrange point sort of idea for space travel or like a platform for going into space? Uh, well, today we are difficult to use. 
uh, my enfin, my uh, my aim is to to build uh, mega structures, mm-hmm. but I think um, the the biggest problem of uh, Lagrange points is the the absence of gravity, and uh, so right. we'll have to re- to resolve it later. Right. So you mean that once we let's say we have these structures in there, like a launching pad or whatever, uh, we have people there, but most of the time. If there's people there, it's in conditions of uh, zero gravity, microgravity, or uh, no gravity at all. And you're saying that that's a problem. Yes. Okay. And I think that's one of the topics we're going to talk about with another group when they're going to talk about all the difficulties of being in space or going into space on the human body and human health. Okay. Uh, anything more to add on there? Uh, I think no. It's okay. Okay, uh, so uh, let's go to Alban. Uh, um, what did you work on, Alban, in, in the presentation? Which part of the uh, transport problem? I'm working on the local transportation on the moon. Can you explain to us what you mean by local transportation and then you give us a short summary of what you found? Yes, so we would need no local transportation for several activities in our daily lives. So we would need a vehicle to explore the moon. Uh, also transportation to move from the landing site to the base and uh, to move around on the moon just to go from one place to another. So uh, in your part of the presentation, we're being very optimistic in that we've already landed on the moon. We've sort of started building the colony. And now the question is, how do we get around? Yeah. Okay. And what did you find? What were some of the uh, projects that are out there or Um, ideas at least that are out there that you guys found interesting, feasible, futuristic, all that? Um, So first to go from the landing site to the base, a shuttle would work. It would be practical so we could save useless trips. So it could be at first a bus for the first few weeks or even months built on the same model that the Lunar Cruiser. I'm going to talk about it later. Um, And so we would have the same wheels and technology to have a well-pressurized cabin so that everyone is safe. Um, And then when the base would evolve, it could be a train or an underground subway for a faster trip. And it would be connected to a transport network. Um, To explore the moon, uh, it would be like the same model than the lunar rover, um, but in the more modern way so uh, we would be able we would need to be able to stay in the rover for a long time because we need to explore further that where we went already Uh, so 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 we're sort of dividing the local transport problem into a question of uh, first of all just getting around I guess the, 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 the lunar colony or the base and then a second problem is how to actually we go to places where we haven't gone and sort of just explore the moon, I guess. Yes, so okay. a few projects are in progress for the Artemis mission. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two of them. Uh, so first of all, there's the Flex Rover. Uh, it was introduced to the general public less than a month ago. Uh, so it's by, the, uh, by Astrolab and it's tested by a former commander of the ISS. So the the advantage the advantages of this is that it can be controlled from earth so this rover could start organizing and maybe building things on the moon by itself Um, and inside you can change from normal clothes to spacesuit and you can travel for a long time so it would be comfortable practical and safe do you have a sort of general idea of the size of something like this or something on Earth which would be comparable to it? Um, it's like a, a bus, pretty okay. much, but you don't it have... It has to be big distance. enough to have sort of not just driving and getting people around, but sort of an airlock so people can get changed and to carry equipment and things like this, right? Yes, but you, okay. it cannot... Um, not too many astronauts can be in this, in this at the same time. Because okay. the equipment is takes a lot of play of play. Uh, and what would be for for this or for any other sort of a lunar transport system? Uh, I guess the main question would be: Well, 
a few questions which are important. First of all, what would be the source of its energy? And then secondly, how would we actually build such an infrastructure? Is it easy? Is it difficult? Do we have the technology, but it's costly? Or is it like we don't even know how to do it? Well, um, it's not done. So they aren't done with the prototype. So they, there's still a lot of work ahead. They don't know yet, but what we know is that is it is hard to carry something heavy from um, Earth to the Moon. Uh, but we could send it uh, with a rocket. Um, uh, there's the Lunar Cruiser, which is a more evolved project that has been worked on for a longer time uh, okay. by Toyota and the Japanese space agency JAXA. Uh, and so we know we have more information on this prototype. So it's driven by a fuel cell electric motor, and we know there might be a solar panel on the um, a foldable solar panel panel with hydrogen batteries for power. So, and we also know that it would have a spacious interior with workstations. So for explorations, it would be really useful. Um, uh, I'm curious, uh, did you find in your research uh, any of these technologies actually being tested on Earth or no? Or is it uh, just no, purely I, theoretical? I think it's still theoretical, um, but they are working on it uh, right now, I think. <laughs> Okay, okay. Um, what are the main obstacles? Uh, so the main obstacles, it's it's probably long to make and costly. And as I said earlier, they aren't done. So we don't know yet all the all right. difficulties they might. So, so I guess the problem is um, we can build it on Earth, but then to transport it is very costly and difficult. Or we can try and build it over there but we've never actually built anything outside of the earth so uh, I guess technologically speaking it's not necessarily known or easy okay um, anything else before we go on to the questions um, yes actually I didn't talk about yes, the Jeanne. last um, the last thing we could use to go on the mood in um, to go to the mood in big quantities Right. So the last and the most feasible project would be to create um, reusable rockets. It's quite difficult because we need uh, really super resistant materials for high heat vibrations, pressure. Um, we need. And, and why is this a why is this a problem? Why is the question of uh... Uh, materials for these kinds of conditions uh, why is that an actual problem to overcome because um, as we would need to use them again right we need to find those materials that um, are strong enough to bear multiple liftoffs and travels whereas and so the, the problem is mainly because of the re-entry or is it for when it's lifting off is it the, the, the problem of when it's coming back through the atmosphere or is it uh, yeah or just it's the... when it's coming back to the atmosphere and also for the liftoff uh, because uh, you have to uh, bear really high heat and vibrations mm -hmm. um, but that's not the only problem um, as the rocket need a lot of fuel using Reusable rockets would also imply uh, using a lot of fuel, and we would need to find um, a more eco-friendly fuel to to try to slow down the um, the global warming. And okay, so so I, I'm just gonna like ask you to stop for a moment, just because I think uh, I'm remembering there was a few questions which were from your classmates which are in that vein so if you guys are okay with it we can stop uh, maybe here with the summary of what you guys presented and we can move on to some of the questions from your classmates what do you guys think? yeah okay yes, yes. alright alright so <laughs> let's go back to Jeanne uh, one of the questions actually uh, a couple of questions that came back was the question of uh, fuel right which is actually a very important question because in a way, the one thing we know how to do well is how to send rockets up into space using combustion. 
uh, and this is a tried and tested method but the problem like we said is that it takes up a lot of space it takes up a lot of mass in fact most of the mass of rockets is fuel um, so we have one question from uh, Domitila uh, who asks why does it take two years to build a rocket if it's mainly composed of fuel um, it takes two years to build a rocket because all the um, the rocket is uh, composed of very very specific um, materials and objects. Right. Uh, you know the fuel part is only the two one or two days before the liftoff. You just have to to uh, fill the rocket with uh, the the specific fuel, mm -hmm. but uh, it takes two years to build that rocket because we need to build really specific parts of the rockets and right. as it is really, really uh, fragile, um, uh, when you need to, to transport it to the liftoff platform, it takes like three days. So it's just adding all those factors. It, the, the rocket is uh, is really fragile, so mm -hmm. you need to be really careful with it. Right. Um, so if I were to sum it up, is that because it's the actual, even if the rocket is mostly fuel, the 10% of it, which is actual rocket, it has to be done in a very, very meticulous way, very uh, specific materials, very specific sort of engineering requirements, because otherwise, in the extreme conditions that the rocket is going to be in, uh, it would not last very long. And at best, it would sort of disintegrate. At worst, it would cause a catastrophe. Exactly. And the engineers have to double check everything about the rocket. So exactly. it takes a long time. Okay. Uh, do, do you have an idea what the main types of fuel are that we use for the rockets currently? Yeah, uh, it's called Ergol. Ergol, I think in right. English. Um, okay. It's a mix of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Okay. And uh, it's um, quite difficult to have because the hydrogen and oxygen have to be at like minus 263 degrees, so almost the coldest temperature ever. Because we have to keep them in a liquid state. Yeah, exactly. Why do we have to keep them in a liquid state? Do you know? Uh, because they have they they're gonna mix together and then with um, electricity um, sparkle it's gonna Spark, light up. Yeah. Okay. And because also in their liquid state they take up less space, so we can have more fuel. Yes. As well. Okay. So keeping the fuel already is a pretty difficult task. It's a dangerous task because they're very reactive as well if they get in contact with one another. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if there has been any research done about new kinds of fuel which might be more efficient, less costly, which might take up less space to give the same amount of energy? Um, yes. Um, uh, Elon Musk already has those reusable rockets but he right. uses a completely different fuel, which is oh. almost like ker kerosene. Okay. Um, okay. Kerosene is what we what we use for airplanes, like jet airplanes. Exactly. Okay. It's a bit modified, but it's almost the same thing. Um, and the point is that it's less costly, but right. it really, really is polluting. Yes. Uh, and there are also some research researches done on reusing um, a Greek like trash from uh, agriculture. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, uh, but it's so in a way we get rid of our waste from agriculture and we use it, reuse it to to fuel rockets. But I guess there might be some disadvantages to that. Uh, it's we haven't found disadvantages. Dis disadvantages yet because it's really um, a project that uh, um, has been worked on th since like a year or or less so okay so it's still in the conception yeah phase it's not, and not a really uh, project okay okay um, did you find any other ways of uh, um, I guess we can use the term fueling rockets that doesn't use combustion. Any sort of very novel or very modern ways that don't use, well, other than the accelerators, I mean. 
that don't have to actually use burning fuel to get stuff into space and to the moon? Um, no, I didn't because uh, as a um, a rocket is almost 770 tons, it right. takes a lot of power to yeah. um, to send it to the moon. So combustion is the only um, technology we have that is powerful enough. Right. But and, and uh, the problem, I guess, being that the main problem is that is the Earth, the the, the gravitational field of the Earth. It's yeah. uh, to get out of it enough to go into space. So we just need a ton of energy, and that's what's keeping us uh, back. Which is why there were all these different uh, hypothetical ideas, like the space line or the uh, uh, sort of platforms in space where we can launch stuff from them. Yes. Okay. Uh, so in that uh, line of thinking. Uh, there were quite a few questions involving the space line or the space lift or the space elevator, whatever name you want to call it. Um, so one of the questions was very practical. Uh, how long does it take? Would it take to go up and down the space line and stuff like how many people can we put in there? How much uh, weight can it carry and all that stuff? Uh, so I don't know if Louis, uh, maybe you have some. Yes. Uh, numbers or some specifics you can give us? Uh, Climbers would have a mass of 20 tons. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, payload, it would be a, a, equal to 70% of okay. the total mass of the climber, uh, something like 14 pounds of okay. payload. Um, climbers will run at solar power. Right, so that was one of the questions, that how do we actually Use, where does the energy come from to make this sort of this giant elevator work? And I guess the solar power, we would take it uh, from the end of the elevator that's in space? Yes, in the oh. first phase of the climb, it would uh, use terrestrial electric power. Okay. And next, when it's uh, above uh, atmosphere, it uh, will use solar panels. Right, okay. Um, how long would it take uh, to go up and down this thing? <laughs> Uh, I think it's uh, something like uh, eight days. Okay, so it's not uh, uh, it's not a quick thirty minute ride. Um, and the reason we can't go faster, I suppose, is because if it goes any faster, the the acceleration forces might be too strong or for the thing to maintain itself. Yeah, the the idea is to have a speed of two hundred kilometers. Okay, so at two hundred kilometers an hour. It would take about eight days. I think we can do the calculations and maybe find the exact time. Yes. Okay. okay. It's uh, a big problem because uh, in this uh, zone, there is a major human problem. Uh, it's uh, the crossing of Van Allen belts. Uh, which okay. Is can you tell us what that is? It's a space where there is a lot of solar winds and radiation that uh, are very dangerous for the passengers of the climbers. Uh, so uh, can you maybe uh, tell us what we mean by these solar winds? What are solar winds? What, where they come from? Why are they dangerous? How are we protected from it in general? Uh, we can protect. Uh, we can be protected from uh, solar winds with uh, lead. All right. So we can have uh, sort of any sort of materials like lead that oh, can protect. Water shielding. The Okay, where, where, where does, what are solar winds itself? What is that? Is it just like a wind, like when there's a hurricane on Earth? It's radiation. And where's, I guess solar means it's coming from the sun? Yes. Uh, and what are the dangers that it can cause? Uh, sun mutation in the DNA. Right, so it's very high energy, ionizing energy potentially. And uh, usually on the surface of the Earth, we're protected from solar winds thanks to the Earth's magnetic field. And that's what gives us those beautiful uh, aurora borealis lights in the polar regions because that's where all the radiation is sort of directed to. Okay. Um, let's see what other questions there were. Uh, some basic questions. Uh, going to the moon by rockets, how, how long does it take? Yeah, Jeanne? Uh, it's about three days. Okay, so 
not that much more quickly than the space elevator just uh, five days quicker but then i guess we're going all the way to the moon which means that i guess in a way if we have to bring stuff all the time uh that's one of the problems of going to the moon is that there's no instantaneous way of reacting right even if something goes wrong on the moon we can't just uh, send people over there to help or take people from there to come back right that's one of the main issues of yes. going to and from the moon um there was a, there were a few questions about I guess fuel and less uh, costly, less polluting, but I guess we haven't really found an answer to that. Um, a question for uh, Alban about the local transport: Would it be possible to create like an underground train network on the moon, or is that very difficult? Uh, did you find anything about that? Um, so it would be great, but it is difficult because it is hard to dig uh, the lunar soil uh, mm -hmm. because so it's, uh, so the first challenge is to get heavy equipment into space, but maybe right. uh, Esteban, Jean or Louis can help us with that. Um, so they are also more fundamental problems, so heavy heavy machinery on earth depends on friction and gravity to provide a stable underpinning while the ma machines uh, can dig and uh, pull and etc and on the moon gravity is different right. so if if it works too hard it will jump or or tip mm -hmm. over or it would have stability problems Right. Uh, so a solution would be uh, to have a counterweight yeah. um, before like starting serious digging with a lot of force needed um, and we could also use a bulldozer uh, that we would screw on the lunar surface but right. it would be really hard <laughs> to do this so so I guess uh, one of the things and I think uh, one of the other groups is going to talk about it the fact that on the moon there is less gravitation is at the same time a good thing and a bad thing because well the good part would be we need less energy to lift heavy stuff so we can lift heavy stuff without a lot of energy but then I guess the bad thing is that most of our technology is based on uh, terrestrial gravitation and so we have to rethink uh, the mechanism for a lot of things otherwise like you were saying uh, we risk sort of just losing stuff into space. Um, so let's uh, start to, to wrap up uh, our little episode here. Um, and I guess any one of you guys can talk about this. Uh, so if you were to summarize everything and to say, first of all, what are the three main obstacles to getting to the moon as we stand today? What would you say they are? What are the three things that we have to sort of overcome to be able to do this in a realistic way, in a sort of, you know, really going back and forth to the moon in large numbers and stuff like that? What are the, the three main obstacles to overcome? Um, one as obstacle would be so uh, Jean, yes. escaping the gravitational force of Earth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we don't have anything other than our current technologies that's realistic to use, I guess. We, we, we could use it, but it's really expensive. Uh, so we are trying to find new technologies to do that in a better way. Okay, okay. So that's one obstacle. What are a couple of other ones that you would say that we have to? So I'm saying basically if you guys were uh, consulting the European Space Agency and NASA, you're like, okay, you have to work on this. And then what are the other two stuff you have to work on? Uh, I think Esteban can. Yeah, Esteban? <laughs> Oh, um, I think well, in a more uh, healthy way we have uh, the impact of gravity, which uh, which is important because there, there is no gravity in the space, so uh, on there is an, a big action on the body, and uh, well, we are losing uh, most of our energy. Mm -hmm. But uh, on 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 a uh, uh, on the rockets and other things, um, they've, I've, I don't know what to say more, but... I suppose the idea is that if we can learn to do stuff in low gravity, like at your Lagrange points or at the space elevator or on the moon, then that will be one thing that we have to learn to do to overcome these yes. difficulties. Yes, of course. Okay. 
Does anybody have a third obstacle we have to overcome? <laughs> uh, so I think that's Louis. I can hear you very far away. <laughs> yes, uh, I think uh, the collision with asteroids is a okay. Problem, especially in the case of the space time. Right, so there is the difficulties of all the dangers of in space being... Uh, so the idea is that in and of itself, I suppose it's not a problem because we send rockets up in the air all the time, but here is a structure that's going to be there all the time. So yes. even if the chance of a collision with a meteorite or an asteroid or space dust is not very high, because it's there all the time, then it's an actual difficulty and danger. Um, I thought of an other problem Jean? that is yeah. less concrete. Um, the problem is that to build this colony on the moon, we would have to get all the space agency around the world to work together. Right. And it's quite difficult to um, to make compromises and to really learn how to cooperate. Yes, we're we're not a good. Uh, I, I suppose it depends, but yeah, c collaboration with various and large groups is never an easy task, and I think that's a theme we're going to see with every group's presentation. The idea in the end of how do we actually manage uh, something of this uh, magnitude? No one country is going to be able to do it. We have to work together, and it's very difficult to work together on such an immense project. Yes. So. Maybe to wrap up, uh, you guys can tell me uh, during your research and all the work that you guys did, because you guys did a lot of work. Uh, did you guys come across any very interesting something uh, that you know caught your attention that you didn't know? I don't know. What did you guys find interesting about your researches? Maybe we can start with uh, uh, Alban. Um, what I found is that basically uh, it would be possible to 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 move around the moon, uh, we already did it and we have more technologies today. So I found interesting that it is, the, I think it is the most easy part of our presentation. Right. right. <laughs> the, the hard part is getting there. Once we're there, we can yeah, figure things out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeanne, maybe uh, did you find anything that was particularly striking or surprising or unexpected? Uh, yes, but it wasn't really about my specific subjects. I just okay, fine. felt that nowadays the, we have changed our states of minds. Um, during the Cold War, we the USA and the URSS wanted to USSR, yeah, wanted yes. to um, <laughs> uh, really be the first to go there, and it was a big thing. And now it's normal to go on the moon, but the um, the real issue is how to get there without polluting how to get there uh with less costly um ways and i think it's interesting to see how uh, the 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 minds have changed right so in a way you're saying at the beginning in the 1960s when we were doing this it was sort of we're trying to prove that it's possible and now that we know it's possible we want to do it in a way that's sustainable I exactly guess. Okay. Uh, Esteban, did you find anything particularly um, striking during your research and all the presentation that you guys did and everything? Or uh, On my point, I find uh, a lot of things uh, regarding uh, megastructures mm -hmm. because uh, this is the main point of my, of my, uh, of my project. Yeah. Um, but NASA and some uh, universities have already uh, studied on and they created like three or four uh, mega structures, which are which uh, answer to to all the, the issues and all uh, we are waiting for uh, to colonize space. Okay. So uh, That's surprising, you were surprised by the fact that we already have a lot of sort of research underway for something like this sort of. Yes, yes, because they are they are a lot uh, advanced, and uh, they are showing they are. We are answering a lot of issues that we 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 are working for in this uh, in this podcast. So uh, okay, okay, very good. Uh, maybe we can finish up with Louis. Uh, did you find anything particularly interesting, striking, surprising in your research? Uh, the thing that surprised me is the fact that uh, space line 
uh, is a, 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 the space lift is not a dream. Uh, I thought that mm. it was a crazy idea. <laughs> that, uh, the principle of the space line can actually work on paper. I think. Right. Uh, and just to put a bit of data on it, even when I was your age, I remember hearing about the idea of the space elevator and even before that. So uh, like you said, it's an idea that could have been out there for a long time. It's very, very futuristic, very strange and unlikely, but uh, we have people working on it. All right. Well, I think we've uh, gone through uh, most of what you guys talked about and a few of the questions from your uh, classmates. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation and all the research you guys did. It was very, very interesting and it was a very nice way to uh, start our project uh, with the class about how to get to the moon and stay up there. So I guess we, we at least, as opposed to the way uh, our moon project is going, have had a pretty good liftoff and uh, thanks to you guys. So I don't know if you guys have anything final words to say. Otherwise, I think we can maybe end it here. Yeah, it's good to Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yes. So thank, thank you. you very much. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, your little posters that we're going to hopefully unveil by the end of the school year. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. Have a, have a nice day, guys. See you. Yeah. Thank have you. Nice bye, bye. 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 bye.